Every time you turn around in Canada, somebody is demanding a national strategy on something. You know, I collect these things and it's astonishing. I mean, people want a national strategy on housing. They want a national strategy on head injuries. They want a national strategy on salt, a national strategy on forestry. The examples are almost literally endless. Now these things won't actually work. But until you know why, it's going to be impossible to stop people from indulging in a fallacy about government that leads them to demand ever more intervention, even though it's futile and harmful to have all this happen. To see why it doesn't work, you need to read Friedrich Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom. Now, need is a double-edged word here, because to be frank, although Hayek was a brilliant thinker, his writing is the kind of stuff that gives Teutonic prose a bad name. The Road to Serfdom is a difficult book to digest, and once you've read it and you've got his central ideas, you're liable to go through a period of inarticulate hand-waving and, yo, that's, but you see, it's got a... Uh, at least everybody I know who's read the book and had it electrify them has had this experience, so be ready for it. He's not Henry Hazlitt. But he is a brilliant thinker. He wrote the book back in 1944, and he addressed it you know, kindly but sternly to the socialists of all parties. And he was right to do so, because by 1947 it was banned in occupied Germany, and I don't just mean in the Soviet zone, though of course they weren't encouraging people to read uh, Hayek over there. It was banned in the Western zones, because it was so critical of the concept of government planning that was so popular then, and for that matter, is still popular today. Every time there's a crisis, every party says the federal government should do something about it. And Hayek says, not so fast. He's, it's natural to think that the government should do something because we have seen that if a government really devotes all its attention and resources to a problem, for instance, winning World War II, they seem to get it done. You go, hey, that's amazing. You know, they, they put aside the normal rules. They said, hey, don't you know there's a war on? They mobilized everybody and everything, and there you go, dead Hitler. That's what we wanted, dude. So then people think we need to do this with everything. You know, national health care, for instance. There's a, there's a popular one. But Hayek said, if you think this is a good idea, you're not understanding how an economy actually works. Once again, we get the difference between what you'd like to have happen and what will really happen. Hayek said, the problem is that if government has just one goal, and when you're trying not to get conquered by Hitler, you do have just one goal that's really overriding, then you can afford to ignore all the secondary effects of your policies until you get this problem solved, and after that you can sort out everything that happened. But if you look, for instance, at a war effort, you see the government says we must have aluminum, and so they divert aluminum from private to public functions. We've got to build aircraft, we've got to build weapons. But people can't get aluminum. Other things don't get done. Production of aluminum suffers because the government can't afford to pay the price it would really need to to get that much aluminum produced. So the producers start finding it difficult to stay in business. Then the government starts controlling the prices of their inputs, ordering people to deliver stuff to the aluminum factories, regardless of cost. Then you get problems elsewhere. Now, fine, there's a war on. We can get through this crisis. Then we'll sort it all out. But the longer it goes on, the worse the disruptions get. And if you're not in a war and you don't have just one goal, so you say, well, we've got to have national health care. Okay, we also have to have a national job strategy, a national housing strategy, a national forest strategy. Uh, you, you know, on and on and on it goes. Well, each of these policies has this overriding goal and is allowed to push aside other considerations, but then the policies start pushing one another aside. The national housing strategy and the national health care strategy each start demanding bricks, say, to build hospitals or to build apartments. Who gets the bricks? How do you settle it? Well, Hayek says, look, if you rely on markets as we normally do, it's amazing the kind of spontaneous order that arises because people go out and they look at the price of something and they say, okay, well, can I afford it? Can't I afford it? They don't have to know how it was made, why it costs that much. There's a marvelous little essay by Leonard Reed, by the way, I'll two for the price of one here. It's called I Pencil. And it's a pencil talking about how it gets made and describing all the components from the lead, which isn't even lead, to the wood, to the paint. And he says, nobody needs to know when they're trying to figure out if they can afford to buy a pencil, why paint costs what it does. Nobody needs to know how paint is made or what goes into the eraser or the ferrule or any of that stuff. They just need to know how much the pencil costs and how much it's worth to them. And in a whole economy that's organized around people doing this, looking at things, figuring out how much do I need it, how much does it cost, should I buy it, shouldn't I buy it. And if, if things are popular, if people need them, then more people are willing to pay for them, the price goes up, that helps producers make more of them. If things aren't popular, people realize they're not selling, 
they divert resources to something else. It's a marvelous, self-balancing, incredibly complicated machine. But when a national plan intrudes and says we're just going to do one thing, it disrupts the organism. And the longer it disrupts it, the more serious the disruption gets. And the more things are disrupting it at the same time, the more disastrous it becomes. Now the upshot of all of this, by the way, Hayek is a member of the Austrian School of Economics, and I know you wanted to know that. But if you think of the normal supporters of free enterprises, the boys and girls with sharp pencils at places like the Fraser Institute, who run it all through a matrix, put it into a computer and tell you to three decimal places why something's a bad idea. Well, Hayek and the Austrians never did that stuff. They didn't believe in mathematical economics. They didn't believe in things like GDP, all these macro concepts. They believed in human action. It's the title of a book by Ludwig von Mises. They said, look at people. People have desires. People have limited resources. So they try to get the most they can by saying, well, I'll have some of this because I really want it, a bit of that because I need it. They work out what's the best use of their time, their effort, their money to satisfy themselves with the kind of things they want. And if you change the incentives, if it's suddenly, you know, oranges get cheaper, people will buy more oranges. Some people really like oranges, they'll rush to the store, others not so much, but they'll buy a few. If the price of oranges gets higher, even the people who love them, well, we can't afford quite as many oranges, perhaps we'll have apples today. So people respond to incentives. The problem is once you get planning and overrule the market and stop using prices, the incentives stop telling people how to organize their lives. It, the scarcity of something no longer shows in a price rise that makes people think maybe I better do without. The abundance of it, the price no longer falls. All those signals get disrupted and then people can't make rational adjustments to changing circumstances. And the longer that goes on, the worse it gets. That's why relying on planning instead of the market creates worse and worse disruption as time goes by. More and more things aren't done according to the spontaneous order of the marketplace. More and more things are done by government command. And it becomes harder for anybody, including the government, to know what's going on. Prices compress information. Prices, I say, push aside all the considerations about why something costs what it does, how it's made. They just, you just need to know the price. But what if you're allocating aluminum and rubber for the war and you say you must give it to us regardless of the price? Suddenly you don't know how it's made. You can't figure out all the inputs. It's mind-bogglingly complicated. You can just say, give it to me anyway. Over time, that's really going to hurt the economy. And this brings me to Hayek's title, The Road to Serfdom. What's that about? This, shouldn't this be the road to poverty? No, because Hayek says the result of relying on these command and control mechanisms instead of markets and prices is that government must overrule your preferences, must tell you what to do, what to buy, where to go, what you can have, what you can't. It cannot rely on your free choice because if it relies on your free choice, it won't be able to gather the resources it thinks it needs for a plan that's harder and harder to carry out. As the disruption gets worse and worse, I think of the government like a man trying to stamp out brush fires with the hem of his pants on fire. Everywhere he goes, he makes things worse, and he runs in more and more frantic circles as the flames get higher. And if you want to see this in action, look at Canada's healthcare system. It doesn't rely on prices. It relies on a government estimate what should an operation cost, not that you have to pay, but the hospital will get to reimbursed. And they make a wild guess. They don't know what resources it takes. The price signals can't tell them. They don't guide entrepreneurs and innovators to improve the ways that we do things that really need to get done, the things that, that patients, in this case that's who the customers are, really need. And as it goes on, it gets worse and worse. Costs get more and more out of line. It needs more and more resources. It doesn't know what it needs. And in the result, not only is it an unproductive system, but it's a system where you don't have freedom of choice. You can't. If doctors could leave, if patients could leave, the whole thing would collapse. So instead, you're told, for your own good, you must obey orders in a system that's not working. That's why national planning doesn't work. Not just Soviet-style five-year plans, but when the government gets into a national housing strategy, national health care, national salt strategy, whatever it may be. Now, as I said, if you go and you read Hayek, you're going to have some difficulty, first of all, because the book is hard to read, and then you're going to have trouble because it's hard to digest and explain. But by the time you're done, you're going to grasp clearly, I promise in the end clearly, why it is that national strategies are a bad idea, that the spontaneous order of the marketplace lets people solve their problems, and central planning with a clear goal and power to make it happen makes the problems worse instead of better. The road to serfdom, we're on it, you need to read it.